Conscious TV with Tom and Ramon. Ramon is AWOL tonight. He uh, seems to have slept in. I'm sure we'll get him to join here in a little bit. Tonight with us, we've got John Lamb Lash. He's an author and teacher, one of the foremost exponents of the power of myth to direct and shape an individual's life, as well as history itself. John is a lifelong student of world mythology, Tantra, Buddhism, Gnosticism, the pre-Christian mysteries, alchemy, astrology, and naked eye astronomy. He has traveled widely throughout the world and has lived in Japan, the UK, Greece, France, Spain, and Belgium. John's published works include The Seeker's Handbook, The Complete Guide to Spiritual Pathfinding, Twins and the Double, The Hero, Manhood and Power, The Quest for the Zodiac, John is co-founder and principal author of MetaHistory.org, sponsored by the Marion Institute. In addition, John founded the Institute for Created Mythology in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Not in his image, it is an extraordinary and profound book. It lays bare the foundation of much of what passes for religion in this culture. In doing so, it lays bare much of the foundation of the destructiveness that characterizes, that is, this culture. That would, of course, be more than sufficient to make this book worthwhile, but not in his image does more. It points the way towards a religion that existed long before Christianity, towards a religion not based on control, rigid hierarchy, and separation from the earth and from the body, but instead towards a religion based on ecstatic immersion in the mysterious and beautiful processes of life itself. I'd like to welcome John Lash, uh, the Telestai of the 21st century. Very well. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. So we want to get started on the foundations here. Would you uh, explain exactly who the Telestai were or the Gnostic, better known today? Well, I'll start with the uh, Gnostics. The word Gnostic and Gnosticism have a considerable degree of currency these days. Uh, people do talk about Gnosticism a lot in some circles. Um, the Gnostic Gospels by Elaine Pagels was published about 20 years ago, and that was sort of the breakthrough book that brought the subject of Gnosticism into the mainstream. However, there's still a lot of confusion about who the Gnostics were, so I'll try to give you my most cogent uh, definition. First place, a Gnostic is just from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. So it means someone who knows. But the special connotation is someone who knows things that are not easy to know. Someone who knows things that are connected to the deepest questions of human existence. The origin of the human species. The nature of our place in the cosmos. Uh, the origin of the earth. And in general, spiritual and metaphysical matters or things concerning the divine. So you could define gnosis as knowledge of the source of human reality and things concerning the divine. Uh, but in their own time and uh, framework, which we'll talk about uh, in the course of, our, uh, of this evening, the Gnostics were probably better understood to, to have been just seers, seekers, seers. In certain respects, they were shamans who explored uh, alternative forms of reality. Uh, they were also teachers and uh, mystics. So uh, it's a very broad definition. Gnostic scholars themselves cannot come to a, a simple and, uh, uh, and uh, one-pointed definition of what Gnostics were. But I think the best approach is to consider that they were men and women in the ancient times in pre-Christian Europe who had a deep understanding of spiritual matters and of the nature of the natural and supernatural worlds. They were seers, teachers, and mystics. The, the telesti, that word, uh, now is that what they called themselves or was the, uh, where did that word come from? The word telestai is a really important word in our understanding of the Gnostic phenomena. T-E-L-E-S-T-A-I, that's the plural, and the singular is T-E-L-E-S-T-E-S. -E -E so you would say that uh, a single person, such as you or I, is a telestis, and the plural is the telestai. Uh, telestai is a word that means those who are aimed. It comes from the Greek root telos, meaning aim or purpose. It means those who follow a common aim, those who are united 
by the aim and purpose that they share. And this is a very profound definition because it raises the question, what could unite people in such an aim? How could a group of people who call themselves Telestai be united? What could the factor be that brought them together and focused them on a single and supreme purpose? And that question is really uh, an excellent question to keep floating in your mind as we approach this subject of Gnosticism and who the Gnostics were. As I point out in my book and on the website MetaHistory.org, the term Gnostic was actually not used by these people, the Telestai, to refer to themselves. It was used as kind of an insult thrown at them by their uh, opposition, who were the early church uh, fathers and the uh, early writers and ideologues of Christianity, uh, who encountered these uh, seers and teachers and mystics and were very threatened by them because they knew so much. Uh, and so they called them Gnostics, meaning uh, know-it-alls, smart asses. So actually it's a bit odd that they should be known today by most scholars uh, for having uh, been labeled with this insult. But among themselves, they did not say, we are Gnosticoi, we are the ones who know. They said, we are the Telestai, we are the ones who are aimed. So the the... The main teachers in the uh, uh, the, the Telestai were called the uh, revealers, correct? They have a word that occurs in the Gnostic documents, foster, from the Greek word phos, meaning light. So it can be translated as illuminator or revealer, and could equally well be translated as the equivalent to Buddha, because Buddha means one who is enlightened. So the term foster is kind of a uh, specialist term, and it simply means those who have the highest degree of knowledge, who have spiritual discernment and knowledge about the human condition and the universe, and they were called revealers. They were not superhuman avatars, or they were not messiahs. They were just human beings with a, an extraordinary degree of uh, enlightened knowledge, and they were the teachers of the Gnostic tradition of the mystery schools. So you, you lay out, a, uh, in your book, you lay out a uh, that they have had a certain method of revealing. Uh, well, they were teachers, and uh, their method of revealing was to, uh, first of all, practice uh, a path of knowledge that allowed them to, uh, to access uh, under deep understanding of the universe. Uh, they did this through what we would call today uh, trance states. They entered into trance, uh, sometimes through the use of meditation, sometimes through physical practices such as yoga, and sometimes through the use of sacred or psychoactive plants. And in these trance states, or these states of heightened awareness, which is typical of shamanism, uh, they understood secrets of the universe and then they turned around and revealed or taught what they learned to, uh, to their students. So what was, their, what was the foundation of their, of their doctrine? What, what is the founding uh, theology or, uh, I don't know if that is the correct word, I suppose theology would fit here. Yeah, theology in a way fits in that the Theology means the science of divine matters. A uh, very good question. Uh, the founding basis of, of the Gnostic uh, worldview, or the, the practice of Celestai, was that uh, each human being is endowed with a, with a germ of divine intelligence. And they called this, uh, in the Greek language uh, documents, is called the nous, N-O-U-S. Now, nous is the root of our word, uh, noetic, and noetics. Um, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with that term. It's not exactly a mainstream term, but noetics means the science of knowledge, the science of uh, the study of, uh, of consciousness and knowledge. So they were, let us say, noetic scientists. And the fundamental principle of that practice was that each human being has within himself and herself 
a germ of the divine intelligence that has actually been planted in us by gods or divine beings that they called aeons, A-E-O-N-S. And the purpose of Gnostic practice was just to cultivate and to develop and evolve and express this divine intelligence. Foundations of this and the, the ideas of the whole Gnostic theology is is so sounds so wonderful and everything. I'm just it just would make somebody wonder what happened to it. If it's such a great uh, theology and uh, way to live life and experience what we have here on this planet. Uh, what was the what factor brought them to non-existence practically in this world? Well, I'd like to answer that question very carefully. Uh, first of all, Tom, I'd like to point out to listeners that when we speak of the Gnostic movement, which was originally called the Magian movement, and it originated in uh, northern Iran about 6,000 B.C., uh, the Magian order, M-A-G-I-A-N. When we speak of this ancient tradition, uh, we're talking about a very vast movement that existed for many thousands of years preceding Christianity and came to expression in a network of schools and universities and cells all over uh, southern Europe, the Levant, the Near East, into Egypt, North Africa, and spreading uh, by the uh, multiplication of these cells, these Gnostic cells, uh, the network spread as far east as India and as far west as the Isles of Ireland and Scotland. In fact, for instance, the, the, the shamans and teachers and mystics known as Druids who lived in the uh, British Isles were part of this great organization of the Gnostic network. And so you need to have this historical picture in mind uh, it's, it, it, in, in order to get an understanding of how vast the movement was. Then to understand or, or begin to consider how such a movement could have been uh, totally eliminated and eradicated, you know, and why. So um, I'm not sure that uh, people who come to my book, not in his image, uh, are aware uh, from other sources of how vast and far-reaching was the network of the pagan mysteries that were uh, schools and universities of spirituality directed by the Gnostics. But it was really vast. And the story of what happened to it is, a, is an untold part of our history and I believe one of the most important but deeply neglected chapters in human history. Of course, you know, you've just finished my book, and I do make an attempt to tell the story uh, of the pagan mysteries and how they were eliminated in my book. I think that the most direct answer leading into your question of why the Gnostic movement, uh, which apparently was, was such a, a, a beautiful opportunity for humanity, and it indeed was, why it, it could have been destroyed you could say in a sense that the whole Gnostic spiritual movement, the network of the mystery schools, and the pagan mysteries, was open source spirituality. It was a to totally egalitarian movement in which men and women participated equally. There was no hierarchy in the movement. It was more like a, a university system of colleges related to each other. And in those colleges, men and women practiced shamanic, uh, ex, uh, shamanic ex experimentation, practiced learning in altered states, shared their learning with each other, and they also turned around and gave their learning out to the world. They were the educators of the pagan world. They taught people to read and write. They are behind all of the great literature, the art, and the architecture of paganism and of the pre-Christian world in Europe, the Near East, and Africa. And this open source spirituality, to get back to my other point, was based on one simple premise. That every single human being has a divine germ of intelligence.